Thank you for joining me on the Sutherland Report once again. And one of the incredible pleasures about doing this is that, as I often say, and I mean it, you can bring on amazing people who you've actually met, who you know, who you've even had the privilege to be on their show and do a po podcast. So without further ado, I am going to bring on Craig Houston from the very well-known Craig Houston 10-Minute Moan. And it's going to be more than 10 minutes. And yes, there may be moaning, but more importantly, it's where people are expressing frustration, but putting over information at a very important time in regard to our country. So here we go. Craig, delighted to see you. Delighted to, to get you on my podcast. So yeah. thank you very much indeed. How, how are you, sir? Yeah, I'm. I'm well. I'm well, busy, but um, no, not not bad, mate. Right. I. I. Um. Why are we? Why are we busy at the moment, Craig? What? What's um? What event is going on? <laughs> could you um? Could you sort of remind us? What? What do you think's going on? Well, I would normally refer to it as an election, but it doesn't seem to be that way just now. It just I mean seems to be awaiting the coronation of Keir Starmer, um, because I think the election. He's already decided. I don't think there'll be any other outcome other than him being the, the Prime Minister and um, we're just sort of showboating to get to that point. I hear you very loudly. Um, Craig, first of all, can I commend you, not because this is uh, brown nosing, but I genuinely commend you for what you're doing on your podcast you. and incredible information that you're bringing because pe people are really, really appreciating that. And we only have to Thank see you. that by, by the comments. And also um, a long form interview. There's one particular interview of, of late I want to get to. Right, this isn't a quiz, but can I just ask you a question? Um, when did when did Margaret Thatcher actually step down, sir, as Prime Minister? I actually can't remember, but it was about 40 years ago. I couldn't put a date on it, but it certainly wasn't yesterday. <laughs> yeah. It was 1990. It was 1990. Yeah. So you, so you, are, you are right. Your your maths is uh, is good. So you did a you did a, made some comment on um, the SNP leader John Swinney in regard mm. to making a comment in regard to drugs in regard to the mortality rate of people mm. living in Scotland going going down. Um, I just wondered if you want to make a you made a brilliant comment comment on that. Craig, why have we reached a point where people are blaming blaming other events, other people that happened in 1990? Why, why, why have we got that atmosphere in regard to Scottish politics? Well, that, that, that atmosphere and, and sort of narrative has been run for a long time uh, by the SNP, where the normal default setting is it doesn't matter what the question is. When someone's asking them, you know, why does this not work? Why are you very poor at this? The, the, the default go-to answer for uh, SNP has been either blame Brexit, blame Westminster, or blame Tories, or a combination of two of them, or sometimes all three. So this isn't a new thing. But what happened yesterday at First Minister's questions in the Scottish Parliament was just bizarre. It just took it to the, the 33rd degree of this whole um, bollocks narrative that they, 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 um, they take. And they were asked a very serious question and it was by um douglas ross the conservative scottish conservative party leader and he asked them to make a comment on three points the point is that and I, the first one is totally bizarre it blew my mind that the 17 years that smp have been in power in here the um the expected life span of scottish people has actually reduced and that, that just blew my mind because that should never be able to happen. The second point was asking why we have the worst um, death from drugs rate per head of capita in the whole of Europe. And the third question was why have alcohol deaths went up in the last 16 years? Now, these are very, very valid points. And John Swinney, who for the non-Scottish viewers, is the leader of the SNP and by default the First Minister of Scotland, went on to say a lot of these things are historic. He quoted some um, professor, um, and some of these things can take 10 or 20 years before you see, you know, if you try to improve work uh, health or if you, you know, you do something that will affect it negatively. 
then made a tirade of nonsense and then finished off his response by saying, and these, how dare you ask me these, Mr. Conservative, because these are things that are you're struggling with because of Maggie Thatcher's policies. And you're like, stop. Just stop the bullshit. And if anybody believes this and still buys into the SNP as a, as a party after this, then they deserve everything they get. Because if you think about it, even his, his, his answer contradicted himself. As he was saying that, this professor in some university had um, said it can take a decade or two for some things to feed their way and to positively or negatively affect these things. Well, that might or might not be true, but you can't use some of these policies for 40 years to try and justify how shite you are at, at these three topics, you know? So it, it, it just, it's mental, mate, but that's Scotland and that's how politics works here. So we're... we're... If we're getting our maths right, we're in 2024. Margaret Thatcher left in 1990, so that is 34. That's 34 mm -hmm. uh, years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And how? Sorry, it isn't like 20 questions and literally trying to paint it dot by dot. But I think it's it's really important to clarify this because you said it. You said it again yesterday, and you said it constantly over the last number of months in various interviews how how long has this party actually been in power in scotland because the, the it's like a cult narrative they've created now I, I can completely understand why back in 2012 when we had the um 2012 up to 2014 when we had the Scottish independence referendum and the, the sort of build up to that and the campaigning for that. You kind of understand why nationalists would have been attracted to them because at that time they were the only nationalist, Scottish nationalist party. So that kind of made sense. That referendum was lost and, uh, well, it's not lost for me, but lost in the, the question was should Scotland be independent and it came back with well, no result. So the Scottish National Party since then really became a different thing and i can understand if, if you were a nationalist why you would you know want to believe in them want to uh, want them to be successful and want to believe every piece of shit that they fling at you and it's getting to the point now and more and more people each day are coming away from the smp now that doesn't mean they're coming away from the notion of nationalism or an independent scotland but they're actually seeing that this vehicle that they believed in is um, a terribly run organisation and is not actually fit for purpose anymore. It's not offering them a route to independence, it's offering them a route to just more arguing with Westminster. So that's why they, they get away with it for so long. But, as I say, their, their, their fan base... The, the, I think the independence question is probably similar to where it was um, 10 years ago, where, you know, there's mo just more than 50% still want the union and under just under 50%. Uh, want to be independent, and you could you could um, argue that for days of you know whether it's forty one or forty nine percent, it doesn't really matter. That's just you know, um, it doesn't matter to what I'm saying. So, but that, out of that, just under fifty percent of people still want nationalism. There's probably only half of them will still vote for the SNP, and there's probably a portion of that half who actually know their shite, but are just still buying into you must vote SNP if you want independence. So I think that's why they get away with it. And they, I think you stated this, so they they have been in power for what, how long? 17, 17, 17 years. years? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if you take 34 and you're still blaming an event, someone 34 years ago and you've been in power mm -hmm. for 17, when do you when do you at that when do you at that point in the seventeen years actually take responsible responsibility yourself for some of these well, actions? And sadly, yeah. the the um this mortality rate, which is which is so sad. How, when do you take responsibility for that? Well, they don't. They, they never will. That, that's just the way they manage the situation. That's the way they govern and. If you ask a nationalist, you see that the devolution, there's devolved powers for within the United Kingdom, there's devolved powers for Scotland, for Wales, and for Northern Ireland. Now, Scotland has more devolved powers than the other two, and I'm not really sure how we got to that point, but that's where we are. And you get nationalists who are crying, you know, it's no fair if, you know, we're shackled, we can't make all our decisions. Then you ask them a simple question what powers do you not have that would suddenly make you 
be able to improve things if you can't do it with the book of devolution you've got just now. And they find it very difficult to answer. Because if they answered that and you said, okay, well, there's another power you can have, this would still be incompetent. And then they would need to accept a bit of responsibility. But they don't actually know what they want, which is bizarre. Because, you know, it's like it's like asking a transgender activist, what is a woman? They can't answer it. And bizarrely enough, something I've started doing recently is asking transgender activists, what is a transgender? Because that melts their head even more. Because actually they describe a transvestite. And then you ask them, well, are you just a transvestite now? And they're like, no. Well, I had a conversation with one um, about a week ago and struggled to tell me what a transgender was. I then asked them what's a transvestite. They gave me a description and I said, you've just described a transgender person. And they went, no, 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 no. Transvestites don't do it their full life. Transgender people do. And I went, okay, so is a transvestite just a part-time transgender or is a transgender a full-time transvestite? Because everything else you're describing is the same. You know? So that's the sort of thing we have with nationalists, that they actually don't know what they want. Because you say, we, 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 we can't have Scotland run into its ultimate um, best uh, because we don't have all the powers. Like, okay, well, what powers do you want that would allow you to do that? And I would suggest having devolution, as it has just now, should give you enough power as a Scottish Parliament to make Scotland a, even a slightly bit more... Um, uh, better than it is just now, which is pretty damn shit. So when they're asking for those powers, and you're turning around, as you just said, yes, we'll give you we'll give you those powers, but then you quite rightly are turning around saying, well, we can give you all these powers, but you're still going to run it extremely badly. So is is there like a juxtaposition where they may say that, but they don't want to go quite that way because then they can keep blaming, I don't want to put words in your mouth, keep blaming Westminster, keep blaming someone else? Well, you're not putting words into my mouth. You're just repeating the, the, the words of the Scottish National Party because, as I said earlier, their go-to response when they get blamed for anything is it's Westminster's fault, it's the Tories' fault, or it's Brexit's fault, or sometimes they tie two of them, two of the three together. Um, and, and they don't accept responsibility for anything. And if you're trying to cure a problem, the first thing you've got to do is actually appreciate there's a problem there in the first place. And when, you, when the problem is not Scottish Parliament, if that's where your mindset is, then it's impossible for you to fix it. And yesterday by actually blaming a woman who was in power up to 34 years ago, so she was in power 40 years ago, and some of her policies would have come in 40 years ago, mm. they blame that for the current ridiculous situation in Scotland where we're actually a country where our expected, uh, life expectancy is actually decreasing. That, that's just mind-blowing. You know, that, and if, if you are a Scottish nationalist who watches and listens to that and still can't see that the SNP are pretty bad, then... Help slap it into you and you get everything that you deserve. When you say that you've there are nationalists that are disaffected with the SNP but still believe yeah. in um a a separate Scotland as a as mm. a nation country to run, where yeah. where do these people go? Where do you think they go politically now? Well, up until up until very recently, they had nowhere to go. And, and that was another thing that was spun by the nationalists for a long time um, and over a long period and became the... You know, if you tell a lie enough over a long enough time, it just becomes the accepted truth. Well, they've they done this very cleverly with the other parties because they implanted it into your brain that if every other party was a unionist party, which you can kind of see how they get away with that, but isn't anywhere near true. I mean, the Conservatives are the Conservative and Unionist Party, so there's no denying they're a Unionist Party. But I would suggest that Liberal, Democrat and Labour, at the referendum 10 years ago, backed the, you know, remaining in the UK. They'd done that because they looked at the two sides of the argument and thought that one was better. Now, if they were given a, a better a plan even for independence that looked as if it might work, they may have said, yeah, we'll go, we'll support independence, but they didn't. So they're not unionist parties, they're just parties that had decided they'd rather stay in the union. So but the SNP, quite cleverly, since 2014, have implanted this notion that every other party is a, a, a unionist party. And that's quite a tough thing for a, a very staunch nationalist to do, would be to vote Labour, or I doubt they would vote conservative but you know you could vote liberal democrat so that notion and uh, option was taken off the table because they were drip fed to believe that everyone else was unionists so they had nowhere to go and that's the only reason that the SNP had anywhere near the votes that they had at some of the recent elections 
Um, but now, uh, Alba Party is a, a, a you know a, a, an option for nationalists, even if they can't get into their head that voting Labour or voting Lib Dem is not voting for a unionist party. It's just it's just voting for a party that could could go either way on the question. So, um, but now that you know they have an easy option for them, and that is uh, Alba. And uh, another option is just saying, you know what, I'm not listening to your shite anymore, and I'll vote Lib Dem or I'll vote Labour. And the, a lot of, in Scotland, when SNP was on the rise, because, you know, they're a 90 year old party, although they've only had any sort of power for 17 years and only really only had any great numbers probably for the last 20 years, maybe 25 at a push. Um, so before that, the, the Scotland was basically traditionally Labour or traditionally Conservative, and it was quite easy to predict what areas would be red and what areas would be blue. But when the SNP came on, um, the vast majority of their vote and support was taken from the Labour Party. Um, and obviously they've got a lot of people who have been voting for them that are traditional Labour voters, and who would have been Labour voters 25 years ago. So now these people seem to be returning in quite substantial numbers to vote Labour. And I think the polls suggest that the whole central belt of Scotland, and for people that don't know the geography of Scotland, that's where people live. You know, the other areas are inhabited, but not the same numbers, and the, the population is very, very densely in this, the central belt, as we call it. That's the corridor between Glasgow across to Edinburgh. Vast majority of populations there, so vast majority of our constituencies are in this smaller area. And the predictions are showing that that could end up being a full red curtain as it used to be. And that's the way it used to be, with little wee pockets of blue. When I was a kid, you would see the, um, the, the election results coming through in a map, and it looks as if that's where we're going. So these people who are traditionally Labour 20, 30 years ago went to SNP because they believed in independence, seem to have had enough, and they're swinging back to uh, normal voting. So you say they're swinging back, and when you just say they have had they have had enough, what do you yeah. think? And sorry, to trying to drill down. What do you think they have specifically had enough of? I mean, you and I could sit here and list a variety of scandals, and in many ways, maybe we would be good to do that because you've been so informative on this. But what what have they had enough of, Craig? I think, and funnily enough, I'd done one of these X spaces last night, um, and that, that was exactly what we we're talking about. You know, where if the SNP went wrong, look at all the, the noise and all the, the fuck ups and all the scandals, and it took three hours. And that was not going in a QA and and opening up to the floor. That was just me and the host talking about them and, you know, going through them chronologically. So that took three hours, and we still didn't cover them all. Um, but, you know, what made people say is enough's enough. Well, I think there's been two things, and I have spoke to a lot of nationalists over, particularly the last two months. I've, I've interviewed nationalist MPs, I've not interviewed a nationalist whistleblower, uh, you know, so I've, I've had a lot of um, contact with the nationalists over, particularly the last two months, and I think it's two things. I think it's death by a thousand cuts. You know, you just get to that point where you just think, Ain't having it anymore. People in relationships go through the same things. You know, maybe on the right, but you, you know, you put up, it, put up, it, put up it for the greater good, and then one day you just say, "Bugger it, I've had enough." So, you know, there's a certain amount of that, and the other thing is they actually do not provide any route whatsoever to achieve independence. So, if you actually look at their manifesto, there is nothing there that's an achievable route to get what you're voting for them in the first place. So people are just like, they don't make sense anymore. So for 17 years, um, certain certain individuals have then been taking, you know, been taking their wage, being paid X amount. And in many ways, do you think that is actually what, what may sound a bit uh, conspiratorial, but you just wonder if that's what they want. They never actually really want full-blown independence because they're scared of that. They can't do it. But what they do want is is the wage and, and just to continue to keep this this dialogue going. I mean, if you think I'm being a bit conspiratorial, please, please tell me. I don't think there's any conspiracy in recognising human nature because I think that's what's happened here. I don't think these people got involved in the SNP because they didn't want independence. I think they, like most organisations, people start organisations or get involved with organisations for wholesome reasons. 
But then other things take over, you know, human nature, when somebody gets a bit of power, they deal with it one of two ways. They either respect that and take a responsibility on board with that and do good things, or uh, they become a bit narcissistic about it and um, turn into Nicola Sturgeon. So, you know, I think that's what's happened here. I don't think anybody's went, I'm going to start the SNP or I'm going to join the SNP for any other reason other than independence. But as they get in the role and then the party grow and the party become a government and the party, you know, get more power, then people's mindsets change. Um, and that's not a conspiracy. That's human nature that can be um, example through lots of different organisations all over the world. So, you know, that, that's just the way it is. There's no, there's no conspiracy theory there. That is just how human beings are wired up. Some are wired up. There's a there's the statue of Donald Dewar in Glasgow, as you as yeah. you know. Um, what do you think if if he was you know still with us? How would he do you think be viewing the situation now? Do you think in regard to the SNP and the of course the devolution the devolution to Scotland? How, but of course, being a Labour guy, he would turn around and say, you know. I want I want the United Kingdom as a whole, but how do you think he would be viewing things and the goings on that have gone on over the last few years? Um, Donald Joe's a politician that I didn't agree with a lot of his philosophies, but Donald Joe's a politician that I could see was a very hardworking man for his constituents, and then you know as his bubble got bigger and his power grew, you know for a wider area, and, and then ended up the whole of Scotland, um, and, and a man that I would. I see a few Donald Jules, to be honest with you, in the political um, sphere just now in Scotland, but very, very few. You know, people that just want to do good, and we might just have slightly different opinions on um, what their you know manifestos should look like. But uh, deep rooted inside a lot or a few of people is a desire to do their job right, regardless of the colour of the rosette. And he was one of them, and, you know, I could cite probably, you know, a good number of them within Scottish politics over the years that I might not have agreed with, but I could appreciate that I'll try to do a good job. Um, he would have probably been his, his um, similar opinion to me and, and, and a vastly growing number of people like me that just think it's complete honesty and it's got to change. It's interesting because... I remember during the and history is important and and to to have a discu discussion like this when we look back and see we look back to see where we are now and we remember in like under the Blair the Blair years going into Gordon Brown years and turning this whole thing of when from an English point of view in England you were then it was this whole thing of the West Lothian question it just seemed that Scot Scottish Labour MPs were then able vote. Um, then the the input in regard to uh, politics as a whole for the country that they then felt they had people felt they had too much influence say on what was happening in in England for argument's sake mm -hmm. and it's quite interesting to reflect back after with devolution with devolution happened and people trying to even even things up Craig um, mm -hmm. I had a discussion with someone the other day that said in regard to Wales. That they're then reliant on 85 percent of financing and money coming from westminster so it'd be the actual figure of trying to get whatever tax is generated in england that goes that way so asking the huge question craig how can in your opinion if if scotland then right will go for independence again how can it actually stand on its own two feet financially how can it actually do that? Well, that it's not my job to um, make that case because I'm quite happy with status quo. The unfortunate thing for the independence movement is nobody on that side of the argument can actually put um, the answers on the table that makes sense. And there's a, there's a bizarre situation of trying, you know that Mandela effect? There's, there's, there's a situation just now where we're actually trying to impose a Mandela effect on a nation with something that did happen and try to convince them it didn't. And that was the um, the question of how we're going to finance ourselves at being independent. And when it was during the referendum, the big play was oil. You know, be oil. We can build our whole economy in oil and we get to go look at Norway. You know, there's a, there's a country that's very reliant on its oil and people suggest it's a successful country. So, 
that's what happened in 2014. Then, uh, about four years ago, sorry, three years ago, the Scottish National Party lost their um, lost their, their majority in the Scottish Parliament and had to form a coalition with the Greens. So now oil suddenly is a bad thing, right? So when they start talking about being independent again, I say, hold on a minute. In 2014, you told us we were going to build our future on oil. Now you're telling us oil's a bad thing. How are we going to survive as a country? And we actually have nationalists who will deny that that happened. It's like they're trying to self-inflict a Mandela um, effect on the whole nation and say, no, that's not what we spoke about. Like, well, Dad, I heard you. And no, 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 that. And you look at the white paper and, God, there's all these, you know, sections on oil. And I say, well, can you remember using Norway as an example of what good looks like? Well, yeah, I remember that, but you can't remember oil. So why would you pick Norway to say this is a successful country? If you were wanting to pick a country that was stood on its own two feet, which wasn't reliant on oil, why did you not pick Spain? Why did you not pick Luxembourg? Why did you not pick Portugal? You picked one that's dependent on oil. So that's a that's set of bonkers way they, they, they appear, they, you know, you look at how the economy would work in Scotland. And there's, there's you know, you ask um, what, what um, currency you're going to use. Oh, we're going to use the sterling. Okay, so you're going to have no control over inflation. You're going to have no control over interest rates. You're actually not going because you're going to, you know, borrow this thing and just put notes in that are printed in England and control. But yeah, that'll be fine. Okay, well, why don't you join the, you're telling everybody you're going to join the EU, why don't you adopt the euro? Oh, well, you know, we don't want to do that. We're just going to use the pound. And it makes no sense, apart from the mind of the most neurotic nationalist. So the, the, the arguments just don't stand up. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to write their manifesto over a white paper for them and tell, you know, how Scotland, I can't figure it out. But anything that they put in front of me, you just look and you think, that does not make sense. And then the ultimate argument is, it's all right, we'll sort it out once we're independent. And that's bonkers. And, you know, we're going to be part of the EU. Now, the EU have already written to the Scottish government before uh, and said, you know, we, we, you can't just come back in. The whole process could probably take. Now, this is a mad thing, right? And I've just, I just stumbled on this this morning when I was looking at social media and trying to digest what's happened in the last 24 hours of politics. And <laughs> we're going to join the EU once we become independent. Right. Let's say it took us 10 years to get independence. It would take approximately 20 years to join the EU. So that means from today, saying those words, if, if, if you got everything you wanted and the whole thing went as the SNP tell us it should, you would be in the EU in, a, in about 30 years. Right. I don't think the EU will be around in 30 years. I don't think it will survive 30 years. So there's another thing that they're building this whole thing on, and it's just a fallacy. There's, you know, there's no, there's no, um, there's no links to reality in most of these um, things that are getting put forward to, to suggest why you will be better, why you will be better in, being independent. And I think the real, the real heart of it is some of the most neurotic independence lovers. They don't actually buy into the notion of being independent. They buy into the notion of having fuck all to do with England. And that's, you know, they've been watching Braveheart too many times and actually <laughs> think Braveheart is a, is a factual documentary and not a, you know, a, a fact-based movie that's got some truths in it. And, and these people live amongst us and they're, they're completely potty. I think I've just got my short, short clip in that last couple of sentences that <laughs> I've heard you say a number of times, which are, which I mean, sadly, we're on one hand smiling, laughing, but it's it 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 isn't a laughing matter. It isn't a laughing matter at all because, as you say, oh, we get independence and then we sort this out. We get independence mm -hmm. and then we sort out the financial move from there. Right. Let's go into another territory, Craig. So your opinion. So suddenly they've got to then have a coalition of the Greens. By having yeah. this coalition of the Greens, and you you've done a number of interviews on the on this subject. What effect has this coalition on the Greens and the Green ideology then had? What effect has this had on on Scotland? Um, quite a, a number of negative effects. I'll give you a, 
the, the amount of wasted money is phenomenal. For example, the deposit return scheme, which is just a non-startup, they spent hundreds of millions of pounds on that. They said that they were going to bring in this new system for, you know, you buy a bottle of wine and what happens to your bottle. And it just made no sense. But they, they, they actually um, forced a lot of businesses into building processes that would, you know, match what they wanted to do. A lot of money was spent by businesses. Um, and the thing never happened because the UK government quite rightly pointed out that you couldn't legally organise it, right? And I got a cracking example of this. I was doing a bit of consultation work for a business in Jersey at the time, and the guy was looking to start um, bringing a, an alcohol product into Scotland. And, a, you know, it was at the start of that process when the deposit the return scheme came in, to put, you know, was starting to get talked about and actually went through Scottish Parliament. And he phoned me up one day. He'd got these this you know, notification about this thing that he didn't know about, and he was all panicky about how that was going to affect his business. And you know, we're trying to launch this product, and what's the effects going to be? And my advice to him was put it in the bin because it won't, just won't happen. But he couldn't understand how a parliament can make decisions that I'm telling him to ignore. Um, and thankfully, he did ignore it and never wasted any money or time even worrying about it. And a few months later, the whole thing was binned. But there was lots of big businesses had lot, you know, made a lot of investment to try and get things ready for this deposit return scheme. That was a complete fallacy and never worked. So although it cost hundreds of millions of pounds to try and implement it, there's now the situation where the, the because of the Greens pushing this policy, that all these businesses take the Scottish government to court to recompense them for the money they lost in this thing that never ever took off. So there's there's that, which is a financial thing. You've got social issues where uh, we have politicians that don't know what a woman is. And that's because the Green Party drive this gender stuff. Now, this is another thing that I, I struggle with. Um, the Green Party, for those who are not aware, maybe it's people know in Britain, uh, started as an environmental party with environmental concerns. And I was watching some of their leaders campaign for during this election. And out of 10 tweets that they put out, only two of them mentioned uh, environmental issues. Because they've now morphed into this independent, Gender critical, uh, you know, LGBT uh, ally, um, immigration, and all these things that I've got fuck out to do with the Greens. Um, so I'm not sure where, where the cat and the horse was on that topic, but at, at round about the same time, we started looking at the gender recognition, which allows people to basically sign a piece of paper and say, I'm a woman, without any, you know, medical. Um, you know, sit down and talk to psychologists to figure out if that, you know, what's going on here. So they, they, they try to push this through. And that was another thing that actually got through the Scottish Parliament and ended up in the highest courts in the United Kingdom before it got knocked in the head. So that you could, I don't know who the horse and the cat was in that situation, whether it was Greens leading Nats or Nats leading Greens, but certainly since the coalition Nats became a problem, um, we, have the, we had the hate crime bill that came out after the coalition came in. It was actually spoke about before the coalition, to be fair, but it was passed when the coalition was, excuse me, was in place. So the negative effects to the country have been unmeasurable for this coalition. And the only um, the only people that, that gained out of this coalition with any positive whatsoever was the SNPs because they actually managed to keep control for a little bit longer than they should have. The rest of it's just all been bollocks. And this, this is why, as well, you've got this turn away from gas and oil. This thing that was sold as, you know, our liquid gold during the referendum suddenly became the devil's product because they got in bed with the Greens and they obviously couldn't be saying, look, oil's a good thing when the Greens would have melted in, in a, a pile of poo if um, they were to suggest such things. So, you know, these implications are all there, I believe, most of purely because of this coalition with the Greens. And as you say, this the uh, the whole green issue. I mean, uh, in regard to then pushing heat pumps, no, we can't have, we don't want boilers. Mm -hmm. We're just going to yeah. find companies, yeah. you know, uh, gas boilers. You're only allowed to sell X amount. If you sell more than that, we're gonna we're gonna find you. There's all this yeah. push for solar. We've got uh, the the windmills all all over the place. And then when you sit down and discuss and say we need as a whole nation x amount of energy uh electricity created and i'm very sorry but this doesn't add up 
in regard to all the alternative stuff that you are pushing and then our own you know our own the own their own weather within within scotland as well can we guarantee this can we guarantee x amount of sunshine no we can't mm -hmm. um i think the amount of rain that has gone on over the last few months in this in uh, this country has been uh, off the charts this year that's just my pers personal opinion but in regard to the whole sexual issues i mean that that is then what brought sturgeon down didn't it i mean finally and the well we don't know we, 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 there's a few things could have brought sturgeon down and although the snp have given us their opinion on it i think we need to take anything they say with a pinch of salt but there was a lot of things happened at the same time you know there was the the um the uproar that the gender recognition um caused not only was it not back by the um supreme court there was also a backlash of public opinion and she left around about the same time. But then we found out with um, hindsight that I think it was a week before um, her resignation, the branch form investigation, which is still a live investigation, that's investigation the party's misuse of funds, um, it became apparent that there was arrest warrants out for certain people. And she left within days of that. But we didn't know about these warrants because, you know, they were not in public domain at the time so you know it could have been that it could have been the gender thing it could have been it could have been as she told us she just miraculously woke up one morning and thought she'd had enough and it was time to move on which is total bollocks but that's what we're told yes because we remember the scenes don't we the the police around certain house yeah. uh etc yeah. etc et an investigation i mean i don't know if you can comment on it but where where is operation branch format where where, I can comment. I can, can, can comment on plenty of things with Operation Branch form. That's the things that the police have put in the public domain themselves without fear of prosecution or bugging up an investigation. And where we're at just now is um, there, there was three people arrested last year. That was Nicola Sturgeon, her husband, and BT, who was the treasurer. They were all a year ago released pending further investigation. Um, since then, her husband, Peter Morell, has been arrested and charged and that the paperwork has been lodged with the prosecution service to decide on what action to take now, which could be take them to court or put it in the bin. I think the second one is probably highly unlikely because of the public nature of this. I think um, there's no going to be, you can't have a cover up now, it's too late. Um, but quite importantly, and um, sometimes you need to look at the finer point to see the bigger picture, the last statement I seen from the police was to say that the man had been arrested. The prosecution service have now been notified. The papers all um, put in to make you know to try and get that to the next step. But also said very very cutely uh, at the end of it that other individuals are still being investigated. So that tells us that there could be further arrests. Obviously, that's just applying common sense and logic, and no breaking any laws by talking about that. And pointing out the word was not individual. It was individuals, plural. So that then tells you, and you, it's safe to talk about this, despite the sometimes barbaric reporting laws we have in Scotland, that there are obviously at least two other people still being investigated. So that, that's where we're at with it. And um, who knows? One of, the, one of the things that we can discuss, and again, you can maybe draw your own conclusions and parallels to what's happening today, but while Nicola Sturgeon had, had stood down and the, the, the Scottish National Party were going through the period of electing their new leader, in the middle of all that, there was a warrant raised for um, to go and, um, you know, go through her house, a warrant to actually go through the door and, <clears throat> and, um, and collect evidence. But it wasn't acted upon until after that election period for the leader of the Scottish Party. Now, some people might think that's a bit peculiar. Some people might think that was um, some sort of influence. And some people might think the word election is still going about today. And guess what? Since the election was called, and right up until today, and we're only a matter of days away from the general election, there has been no movement in the branch form investigation. So, as a parallel to be drawn from that, then... I'll leave that to you to decide. And the other thing that people may not know, it may be worth noting, um, people are not Scottish or, you know, 
quite um, up on how Scotland operates. The head of the prosecution service and the whole criminal uh, industry in Scotland is actually a member of the Scottish government's cabinet. If you want to think that's a safe thing, and you know, people conflict interest interests would suggest that these things would never be spoke about at cabinet level because that would be bad. And I'm not suggesting people do bad things. I'm just saying that obviously things like this, things like the first minute, the previous first minister's brother was us was arrested on a drugs charge, which became a murder investigation. And the person at the top of the tree was sitting in the same cabinet as the first minister, whose brother-in-law was a guy who was arrested. Who am I to suggest these things wouldn't would have any bearing on each other? And I'm quite sure the people um, in these positions would never allow a conflict of interest in anything they do. I hear you. I hear you very loudly and quite. And we are you're putting facts. Uh, discussion into into the uh, into the public arena for people to uh, make up their own mind and I, I have to say I'm not just saying this because I know you and um, I commend you for it and commend you for everything that that you are doing and in the last few the last few minutes and you you have done interviews about this you've been there are discussions discussion this in regard to getting the SNP out right and you know that for some of us we're going to have to maybe vote for parties that we might not fully agree with but we want to see a change what what is the advice where can people find that information what organizations can they go to to work out where the where the play is in their particular well, constituency that's this is the thing just to highlight the importance of this and we're currently done a uk election phase just now and we'll be followed up within the next two years for a Scottish Parliament election. And it's far more, it's actually far bigger than just replacing the SNP here. Obviously, that's what a lot of people want to do. But as a byproduct of doing that, the way the politics work and the expenses, etc., in politics work, we could actually bankrupt the SNP by removing them from power, which means it's not a short-term fix, it's a long-term fix. Because you can actually bankrupt and have their party not operating anymore. If the results of the next two elections go the way I hope. So, you know, it's a far bigger thing than just, you know, let's get them out. Like, you know, not that long ago, 12 years ago, the, the, the um, British nation decided to get Labour out and that led to 12 years of Tory rule and now they're going to run Parliament again. So it's even bigger than that that we can do with the SNP. We could actually bankrupt them and probably make them to cease to exist. And it, it, the way to do that is to tactically vote. And we can tactically vote as unionists and nationalists now because the nationalists could quite simply vote for Alba where they are on the polling card because they're not in every constituency, but they're in quite a lot, you know, about a third of the constituencies. There will be independent candidates that nationalists could vote for if they still buy into this ethos of everyone else is a unionist party and that's a step too far for them. And then the unionists or middle of the road that don't see themselves as unionists or nationalists that just want to bury the SNP. There's um, quite a lot of data online, and I'll give you the, the link to the one I'm endorsing, and that's yeah. the Scotland and Union um, online one where you put your postcode in and it tells you who you should vote for. Um, and that's not just based on prehistoric five-year-old election numbers, because that would be dead easy. You just look who came second to SNP five years ago but that, that that's made up from a lot of data and a lot of you know um polls etc so that you know it's not just finger nail and it, to be fair there's probably two or three different outlets given two or three different versions of who you should vote for and um they don't agree a hundred percent but there's probably only two or three seats where they slightly vary so the, the, regardless of what one you pick you're, you're, you're not going to make a big massive uh, difference to the event however I've recommended the Scotland and Union one just because I've been able to speak to these people you know, at length to say, look, see, before I endorse this and start sharing this and possibly affecting my integrity, how do you come by the figures? What do you do with these figures? How do you, how can I be sure you're not party driven? Right? And I was, I was happy with the information I got back in, in two quite extensive conversations um, to endorse that. And that's the uh, Scotland and Union. And uh, I'll give you the, I'll get you the line for just look up now because it's not Scotland and Union is the, the website but they have built a new um, 
website purely to have this um, asset in it. Where are we? Scotland Union and tactically, so it's tactical vote Scotland dot uk that's the website and you go on there and it's dead simple you put in your postcode it'll come back just to verify that you know this is a constituency and you should vote for x y z now quite the majority of those seats are the the result will come back for labor and probably five or six seats from memory or suggest you should vote conservative and i think one or two they suggest you vote liberal democrat so, um, and the whole central belt is just vote red. The, the blue areas for conservative are tend to be borders or some pockets up northeast. And the um, the ones where you would be voting Lib Dem are like um, Orkneys and, you know, some of the, the, the small islands up north. So uh, the, 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 the default is Labour, you know, and, and it's vote red and that breaks my heart, but I'll pinch my nose and do it. And I had a lot of debate about this last night when we'd done this X space. People say, oh, I can't vote Labour and I can my conscience would bother me voting Labour. And what I was saying to these people is I can't dictate how anybody votes. I can only tell you what I'm doing. And I've had to go through this um, process in my own head. We have to just face facts. Whatever you vote, you are not going to make Keith Starmer be the next Prime Minister or not, right? That's happening. So if it's, oh, I can't vote for Keir Starmer, I couldn't live in myself with being, a, you know, putting in place a Labour leader. Well, it kind of going to happen regardless of what you do. And the way I get it around my conscience is I'll not feel great about voting Labour. However, the option, the other option I've got is vote someone else. And I couldn't live with my conscience if I woke up on the 5th of July and my constituency returns an SNP candidate Labour came second, and I voted for somebody that came fifth. That 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 would melt my head. I couldn't cope with that. That would really annoy my conscience. It's a far easier thing to deal with me actually just walking into a polling booth, squeeze my nose, and putting an X next to Labour. That's an easy thing for me to do. I couldn't handle the alternative and not voting Labour and SNP still get in. So, because I know that as a byproduct of them losing a lot of seats at Westminster, it could lead to the eventual downfall and end of the party. So I'll do, I, I, you know, I say this flippantly, right, probably when they do it, but I would I would consider voting for the Taliban if I thought the SNP would get put out of power, you know, that's how much I, I, I you know, I, I would probably, you know, I was watching some videos this morning from what went on in America last night and it, and it just amazes me. But I would probably actually prefer Joe Biden as my MP than anybody for the SNP and that man's evidently incapable of doing even that type of job, you know. Um, but, you know, again, your comparison, I would prefer Joe Biden to the SNP, and that's how ridiculous the SNP are. I think what you're describing is, is in many ways, how uh, frustrated, how desperate you've, maybe desperate, maybe the wrong word, but how uh, frustrated we feel and uh, what we have to actually look at to to get to get things changed. Craig, I just want to, I want to, Thank you for your time. And also, before you go, I want to commend you for your excellent interview with uh, Shannon Donoghue. And yeah. um, and just I need to put a link in there for people as well mm -hmm. to find that because it's excellent. And also yeah. other interviews that you've been doing with incredible people and also the lady mm -hmm. that then was arrested under the, by the whole, whole hate crime uh, yeah, laws. Warwick um yeah. and of the particular age that she was she is and it was just it was just uh just an out an outrage and if i can give you sorry before we go if i can give you a minute of that where are we at with the with the hate crime laws are these uh with suddenly having to find extra members of of the police to uh you know investigate all this the resources where where is the scottish nation with the hate crime laws I think it's very much where I predicted it would be, and that would be no different from where we were yesterday. Right? I, I done a uh, um, an interview podcast with one of the country's leading KCs, Thomas Ross KC, um, prior to it, and we discussed it, and he gave us his opinions on the the law and what would happen. And my position at the time was it will be a replication of what happened with the the um, offensive behaviour at Football Act that was passed many years ago, and was utter bollocks and ended up getting repealed. Um, whereby the law, 
what they were expecting police to charge you for doing whatever it was that they found was on illegal was actually illegal before the hate crime came out. Because if you want to take to the streets and shout absolute nasty things at people, then you could be arrested for that before the hate crime came out. You got a breach of the peace, for example, for it, practically anything if the police don't like what you're doing. So, you know, even if you said something that wasn't offensive and the police just decided they want to arrest you for it, they could just simply arrest you for a breach of the peace. But there were laws in place that stopped me going out and being, you know, very identifiably um, um, hurtful to people and inciting violence and all these things. You, you could have been arrested for all these things last year. You didn't need the hate bill to do that. So, I don't, and I'm going to sit down. I've already spoke to Thomas about it, and we're going to do a follow up to that once the hate bill, and we can look at figures and see the real effect. So we don't have the exact figures now, but I don't know anybody that's been actually charged, went to court, and been um, found guilty with any hate, any crimes that, that that came from the hate bill. So the result is there's no change in terms of um, criminality. But what we have seen is, not me, I've, I've always been careful. What I've said, I've never went out deliberately to offend anybody in my life. But I do understand some things I say may be construed as offensive, to, you know, depending on whose ears they're, they're falling on. So I've always been careful what I say in public. But what happens is some people, and I include Thomas Ross KC, because he actually told us this during the, the podcast, will not get involved in debates for fear of being found offensive, not offensive by your, your your measures or mine, offensive by whoever it is that makes up the, the measure of what's offensive. Yes. So debates, it's been stifled. People are not able to talk. A bit bizarrely, although, because the, the, the gender issue, the volume in that has probably been turned up since the hate crime, which is a bit weird. But that's just because of other things that's happened, you know, men in women's prisons and try to, I don't know if you've seen the uh, interview I've done recently with a, a mother of a four-year-old who was sexually abused in a toilet, which was a same-sex toilet in a nursery school. And I'm thinking, how did we get there? You know, and all these things are a byproduct of this transgender activism and push for communal everything. Um, but people are, you know, quite watching their words. And there could probably be a lot of people, like Thomas Ross QC, who said he will never talk publicly about gender. People like that are very educated and very knowledgeable that could provide a valuable part of that discussion. They just don't take part in the discussion. So the hate bill is not seen the prisons get full, but the hate bill has seen the volume reduce and the participation reduce in what should be healthy debate in Scotland. And that's the bit that you can't measure. You know, you can't put a, put a measurement on that. Um but that is, you know, that's what's happening on the on the ground. Well, we're going to I, see. You, you, Sorry. you mentioned the Shannon interview. There's, mm. you know, my, my, my podcasts have taken a weird, a weird um, route where um, I'm obviously a unionist. I never, you know, hide for that fact. I never try and camouflage it. Um, I think that's an acceptable position to be in life. So I don't see why I should try and camouflage it or, or tone it down. Um, but. The amount of un uh, nationalists now that support what I'm doing and um, get involved with what I'm doing, because my main aim right now, and again, I've been front and centre and I've not hidden behind any you know, fancy words. I've said before the election was even called, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and, and campaign for Scotland to um, tactically vote and the hope that we can reduce their power at Westminster and reduce their income and actually bankrupt them. I've been very open with that. I don't, you know, that. if other people were doing this sort of thing, they would probably try and hide behind nice, comfortable, politically correct words. All up to that, I want to see them die, right? So I've been really, really front with that. And I've actually attracted a lot of people from the nationalist side, and it's very refreshing. And I've done an interview with uh, one of the ALBA candidates in XSMP, MPs, Neil Hanby, Great guy, really respect him. I just have a different constitutional view and things than he does. But the one that I done with Shannon was so powerful. Yes, that, yeah. that woman, um, really, you know, good, 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 good girl. You know, brave girl, and just put us. You can imagine she was really frustrated for a long time, but she sat there and put the points across in a very measured manner. 
there's no, you know, there's no correct, out, correct, yeah. emotions. Absolutely. And I'm sorry to jump in because we're running out of time, but I commend you okay. for that very much because with all of us, and it's the same with America, you know, American politics is another good illustration of that, where the phrase is, we're trying to reach across the aisles. And that's why I commend you for that um, incredible discussion and other interviews you're doing because we want to reach it. In other words, we're trying to get back where we can sit down and have a very mature discussion, agree to disagree, but to try and drill down to the facts and why. Craig, I just want to thank you for joining me for no a fantastic discussion. I commend uh, Craig highly. Find Craig Houston Talks YouTube. Um, follow him. And uh, as he says, smash that like and uh, and follow him and uh, his 10 minute moans are wonderful 10 minute commentaries of what is happening in a country that he loves to bits and uh, and is very informed about so craig i'm going to play us out stay with me over the other side and uh, i can shake your hands and say thank you for the digital medium but thank you very much sir for joining me no problem thank you for your support